Amen. Praise God, my brothers and sisters. God be all the glory <clears throat> on this evening. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am Pastor Gregory White of the Lord House of Prayer, our people, Missionary Baptist Church. We're located at 9318 Southwestern Avenue. That is in Los Angeles, California, and that zip code is 90047. You can reach us by phone at 424-203-9651. Now we thank and praise God tonight to be back on the radio airwaves to be able to share the word of God with you on tonight. And we thank you for tuning in to the broadcast. I want to thank God for Dr. Thomas Blackwell, who is the president and CDO, CEO of KTYM broadcasting station here in Inglewood, California, and we thank God for him making this uh, possible for us to come to you and share God's word on tonight. As usual, we give our Holy Ghost shout out to our host pastor of the Saturday night 6.30, 7.30 slot, Pastor Charles Ashley of the Perfect Peace Bible Church. His church is located at 11151-53 South Broadway in Los Angeles, California. That zip code there is 90061. We want to keep uh, Pastor Ashley in prayer and also uh, his wife, First Lady Geraldine Ashley. Thank you for those of you who have been lifting them up in prayer and God is doing some wonderful miraculous things in the life of pastor and wife and his church. Amen. God bless you tonight. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and we praise you for this time together. We thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us and allotted us this moment in time to stop, to give you thanks and to give you praise for all that you have done, all that you are doing right now, and all that you are going to do. We are certainly most have hearts of gratitude, attitudes of thankfulness, and hearts of praise, for you've been mighty good to us. We ask now that you will forgive us of our sins, of word, thought, and deed as we come in your presence. Then, Father God, we pray for the broadcast on tonight. We pray for those who will be listening. Pray for those who will be tuning in. Pray for that you would touch the hearts of the people and give them a new revelation and a fresh rhema word uh, of who you are. Then on tonight, we pray that someone would get saved most of all and know you in the pardon of their sins. Bless our time coming. We know that it will never be in vain. The time spent with you is well spent. In Jesus' name we ask that. Amen. Thank God. Okay, we bless God on tonight, my brothers and sisters. Our place of study tonight is going to come out of St. John, if you have a Bible, or you have your tablet or your phone, and you want to follow with us, we want you to go to the Gospel recorded by St. John, chapter 14, and we will be reading verses 16 through 18 in your hearing. And we find these words. Jesus is speaking here. It is in red, and it says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. And I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. And from those, those verses, we want to talk uh, just for a little while about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Person and the work of the Holy Spirit. First, we ask the question, who is the Holy Spirit? He is the Spirit of God. He was, the Holy Spirit was present in creation when the creation of our world and our universe, the Holy Spirit was present. God the Father, God the Son, 
and God, the Holy Spirit. Thus we have the Godhead in its fullness. The Holy Spirit was actually present and played a major role, a significant role in the plan creation. In the beginning, in Genesis, the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. First, we have God the Father. And when we say the scriptures says that God said, let there be, that was the representation of Jesus Christ when he was speaking in reference to the word because Jesus is the living word. When we look at St. John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in, in the beginning was the Word. But we must first understand that St. John, so you have St. John in the beginning was the Word. And then you have Genesis that says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But actually, St. John's beginning is before Genesis creation. Because it says in St. John, the Word, which is Jesus Christ, who was in the beginning with God. In the beginning of what? In the beginning before the creation, Jesus was with God. Scripture goes on to say that this same word was in the beginning with God and all things were created by him, which was Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who was active in creation. So when God said in Genesis, let there be, Jesus was the word that God was speaking, the spoken word, the living word that creates all things. And the Holy Spirit was actually the workman or the work person who did the work in the creation when he said, let there be and let us make. Thus in Genesis 1.26, God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. When he said, let us, talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus, in our text today, promises this great and unspeakable blessing of the Spirit to the disciples. It is promised that they shall have another comforter, he says in St. John 14, who shall be with them and shall be in them. The Holy Spirit in this context is referred to as, in this setting, the paraclete in the Greek or the advocate. This paraclete or advocate is compared, is in comparison to the comforter or the paraclete, one who walks alongside another. In comparison to a lawyer in the courtroom who walks in with his client. So the Holy Spirit is always before the throne of God, pleading against the accusations that Satan makes against us as believers. Because the Bible says, day and night, he is before the throne of God. He's the accuser of the brethren. When Christ was here on earth with them, he was their advocate. But now that he is getting ready to leave here in this chapter, chapter, he's getting ready to make his departure. He is preparing them for after he departs for them to be able to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. He teaches his disciples that he will pray to the Father. And he shall pray to the Father and he shall send the promised Holy Spirit. Jesus calls him in the text another comforter. We see here that the gift of the Holy Spirit is actually because of or a fruit of Christ's prayer and his mediation for the disciples. And it has taken this gift out of his intercession for the disciples. When he says, I will pray the Father and he shall send you another comforter. That phrase, another comforter, in the Greek, it actually means another of the same kind, meaning Christ would leave, but he would send his own spirit back, meaning that the Holy Spirit now is the spirit of Christ. 
So when he said, I'm going to pray the Father, he'll send you another comforter. That's another of the same kind or the same person will be coming back. Because and when you read in the text, he says, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to be back and I'm going to be with you and I'm going to be in you. So that another comforter means another He's leaving, but he's coming back to dwell in them. So who is the Holy Spirit? The scriptures reveal the Spirit that he is a person. Yes, he's a person. With all the characteristics, qualities of a living being. How can you say that? The scriptures reveal that the Holy Spirit is God. With all the characteristics of a divine being. Scriptures reveal the Holy Spirit to be equal on an equal level with the Father and the Son, though distinct in them in their roles. They are equal, but they have different roles. Sometimes it's puzzling as we study uh, the Holy Spirit. Why is it important? Why do we need to know who the Holy Spirit is? Why do I even need to know who he is? I need to know who he is in order to interpret and understand the scripture. Because the interpretation and the understanding of the we can read it, and we can study it, and we can read it, and we can study it, but the interpretation of it comes in through by the Holy Spirit. Not only do we need him for the interpret of scripture, since he is God, we need to give the Holy Spirit his recognition of worship, and we worship God and praise God, but he deserves to be honored on the same level as God because he is the Spirit of God. If I do not know who the Holy Spirit is, what if I don't know? Then if I don't know who he is, I will not enjoy a proper relationship with him, and it will hinder his ministry in my life. Why believe that the Holy Spirit is a person? He is a person, and when we refer to the Holy Spirit, we never refer to him as it. I would say the Holy Spirit, it did this, it that. We don't refer to the Holy Spirit as an it because he is a person of the Godhead. Many people see God in the Trinity as he, he, God the Father, God the Son, and they look at the Holy Spirit as, as it. In the King James translation of the Bible, God is masculine. It is a masculine word in the original language. Jesus is a masculine word, but the word spirit is a neuter word. The concept of the word Holy Spirit is foreign to the English language. The word is literally, when you say Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, it is literally breath or wind. You see him moving as wind or, or breath. Though it was also translated spirit in A.D. 1611 when the King James Bible was translated. As a result, the King James Bible, sometimes it, it refers to the Holy Spirit as it. Because of this, some are confused as to whether he is a real person. He is, of course, a real person of the Godhead. And many recent translations changes that and refers to the Holy Spirit as a he rather than it. One key reason why we believe in the personality of the Holy Spirit is he has characteristics of a person. He has three characteristics that distinguishes him as the person of the Godhead. One, he has intellect. He is intelligent. Two, the Holy Spirit has emotion. And three, the Holy Spirit has a will. An example of his intellect, per se, is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Intellect. It says he knows the things of God. So if the Spirit knows the things of God, he must have intellect. He has knowledge. He is intelligent. An example of his emotions is found in Ephesians 4.30. Here we read that it is possible to grieve the Holy Spirit. It says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. 
You cannot grieve an impersonal force. So here he's intelligent and he can be grieved. He has personality characteristics of the person of the Godhead. Finally, an example of his will is found in 1 Corinthians 12 and 11. For we read that the Holy Spirit gives gifts unto men as he will. In addition to possessing the characteristics of the personhood, intellect, emotion, and will, the Holy Spirit does things that only a person of the Godhead can do. He is a spiritual person. The Holy Spirit, he does things only a person could do. What things does he do? He teaches us. Yeah, if he has intellect and he's intelligent, then he's able to teach us. He prays for us because uh, it talks about him praying for us. I believe it's in Romans it says that we don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit prays with words that cannot be uttered. So uh, he, he prays for us. Actually, as we are praying, he's praying with us. He's praying for us, but he actually, as I began to pray, then the Bible says he helps my infirmity or my weakness where I don't know what to pray for. But as I am praying, then he prays with me. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Say, for instance, if you tell me, pray for me when you go home tonight. I say, okay, I'll pray for you. I'll go home and I'll forget. And when I start praying, the Holy Spirit and his intellect knows the mind of God and he knows the mind of man. So if I say, if you say pray for me and I forget, then he will pray for you on my behalf, on your behalf, because he, he, he has an intellect, he's intelligent, and he knows the mind of man. So he prays on our behalf for those things that we may not be intellectually, uh, as far as the word of God is concerned, we may not have revelation to pray about in the things of God, but we need those prayers answered and we need those things done, then the Holy Spirit will pray on our behalf. So he teaches us. He's intelligent. He teaches us. He prays for us. He performs miracles. He comforts us. And he guides us. These are deliberate references to the Holy Spirit personhood. Today, those who do not believe the Holy Spirit is a person usually believe that he is just a spiritual force coming from God. They say, I believe, you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I believe it's, but they don't, if you ask them, do you believe he's a person of the Godhead? Like Jesus Christ was a person. He was actually a person. He lived here. But the Holy Spirit never came here and walked like Jesus did. But when Jesus left, he came back and dwelled in, in men and he dwells in us as the Spirit of Christ. So far we have looked at who the Holy Spirit is. We looked at why we believe the Holy Spirit is a person. Now we ask the question, why we believe the Holy Spirit is God. Because you may say, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we don't believe that the Holy Spirit is equal with God. If it's God's Spirit, he has to be equal. Let's say, well, how can you have, uh, Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. Because the Father is in me and I'm in the Father. And he talks about the Holy Spirit. He talks about sending him back and the Holy Spirit being in the disciples as he was with them. So he said the Father himself and the Father and the Spirit are all one. And he said, well, how can that be? That's impossible. You have three entities we have one entity, but you have three separate distinctions of their roles. But God the Father is above all. He is God the Father. But then you have Jesus and you have the Holy Spirit. But then Jesus says, I am one with the Father. and We are one. When you see me, you see the Father. And then you can might say, well, how can you have three and they be one? Okay? Same way you three and one. You are a spirit. You possess a soul, and you live in a body. You have a trinity 
makeup. Try makeup. You're, this body that we live in is not who you are. The body is not who you are. That's just the vessel that you have to that you have to live in the house that you live in while you're in this earthly physical realm. Who you, we are a spirit having a human experience because when you when you die, the real you, your spirit, soul goes back to God, and your body just goes back to the dirt. So just like you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you are a spirit. You possess a soul and live in the body. Your soul is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions, kind of similar to the Holy Spirit. He has intellect, he has emotion, and he has will. You have a mind, your soul part of you is connected with your spirit. That together, your soul is your mind, it's your will, and that's your emotions. That's your soul. So you are spirit, soul, and body. God is God the Father. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There is ample evidence in Scripture to verify that the Holy Spirit is a divine spirit. The fact is found in Acts 5, 3 through 4. There was a story that was told in Acts. Two converted Jews, <coughs> you probably heard the story, Ananias and Sapphira. They sold a piece of land they owned, and they brought the proceeds of the sale that they sold the land, they brought it to the church. But they kept some of the money for themselves and gave the rest of the money to the Apostle Peter. However, when in this transaction, Ananias and Sapphira lied, telling Peter that they were giving all of the money that they sold to the church because other people in the church at that time were selling their properties and they were giving all of the money to the apostles, to the church. And the church uh, distributed to the, to the needs of the people as such. So they, they wanted to be known, I guess, or they wanted to look some kind of way. So they said, we're going to do it too. They went and sold the land, came back, told Peter, okay, we sold the land, here's all the money. But they lied and kept some of them. Peter learned Later, that they lied and that they did not give him all of the money as they said. <clears throat> then Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now watch this. Follow me right here. He says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And keep back part of the price of the land for yourself <clears throat> while it remained. Was it not yours to do with what you wanted to do when you sold it? It was in your control. And then, first he says, why have Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Then he turns around and says, why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have lied not to men, but to God. First he said, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Then he says, you lied. You're not lying to me. You lied to God. Peter declared to lie to the Holy Spirit is a lie to God. In that instance, when he said that, Ananias fell dead. After that, his wife Sapphira came in because they made up the lie. She came in and told the same lie that he told. And he told her, and you came in and told the same lie that your husband told. And the guys that took him out and buried him, they're on their way to get you. And then she fell dead. So the point I'm making, he said, you lied to the Holy Spirit. And then he turned around and said, you're lying to God. In addition to this, the Holy Spirit has three characteristics of God. He's all-knowing. It's called, he's omniscient. Omniscient. He's all-powerful. It's omnipotent. And he's everywhere simultaneously. He's omnipresent. Now, the devil is not omnipresent. People think he's all over. He's not. He's one entity, but he has demons and he has spirits uh, and imps to do his bidding. He's not all everywhere omnipresent like God is. In 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11, God has revealed to us through his spirit. 
For the Spirit searches all things. Yes, talking about the Holy Spirit, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. So man cannot know the things of God except it is revealed to him by the Spirit of God, which is through the Holy Spirit. We read in creation, in the creation account in Genesis chapter 1, that the Spirit participated with God in the creation, implying his omnipotence, his power. He played a part in creation when he said, let us make man. And finally, concerning the omnipresence of the Spirit, King David wrote, in Psalm 139, 7 and 8 and 9. says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? He goes on to say, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. Now we see the Holy Spirit, number one, omnipotent, all-powerful, helping in creation. He is all-knowing. He is omniscient. He searches the hearts and minds of men. He is omnipresent because he is everywhere at the same time. Now when we look at these terminologies and break down these three words that we just used, omnipotent, the prefix omni, means unlimited in a particular thing, meaning impotent, meaning power. So omnipotent means God is unlimited in his power or potency, which is the same as the Holy Spirit. Omniscient, or omniscient, or omniscience, or omniscient means unlimited in science or unlimited in knowledge. As God is unlimited in his knowledge of everything and everybody. The Holy Spirit searches the hearts of men and he knows the minds of God. He's omnis omniscient. He knows everything. Omnipresent. Omni, unlimited in his presence. Meaning the ability to be present at all places at all times. But as we look we want to look at St. John chapter 14 just for a moment. As we look at it, as the chapter opens up, we see Christ is consoling the disciples. He comforts his disciples, professing himself as he's telling them he is the way, the truth, and the life in the first part of the chapter. He tells them that he is one with the Father. Then he tells them later on in the chapter that he's going to leave but he's going to leave his presence with them. He starts off saying, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So here in the text, we see he's uh, making himself one with God. He's letting them know that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. If you believe in God, believe in me. When you see me, you see the Father. So he's making that uh, context of him and God, the oneness of him and God. Then he goes on and says, My father's house are many mansions. One I saw, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Here he's making mention, getting them ready to let them know that he's going back to be with the father. He's going to leave, but again, he's going to come back. And then Philip, Thomas and Philip, are puzzled. He's telling them, he said, we don't, if you leave, we're not going to know what to do. We're not going to know the way. And he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. Then he goes on to say, if you had known me, you should have known my father. For when you see my father, when you see me, you've seen him. Here he is making a reference again of him and God as being one. Okay, then he says, believe it thou that I am in the father and the father in me. Believe me that I am in the father or else believe me for the very work's sake. So here he said, believe me for who I tell you that I am. And if that's the problem for you to believe me from me telling you, then believe me for the works that I do. And that's the reason we were talking about the Holy Spirit. Who is the person of the Holy Spirit? Who is the work of the Holy Spirit? And since Jesus went back to heaven, the work that is being done now is the work of the Holy Spirit. 
actually, when you look in the book of Acts, the book of Acts is the history of the church. That's what they say. It is the history of the church. So if the book of Acts contains the history of the church, then it's safe to say that the book of Acts is still being written. It can't be closed if the church is still here. So if it's the history of the church, the history of the church is still going on. It's still being written in our day and in our time, the history of the church. That was the history of the first century church, the New Testament church when it first started. But the history, the church, history of the church is still being written. And so when we look at, in the book of Acts, we look at it, and most of the time when you look in your Bible, and when you look at the heading of the book of Acts, it is going to say, the, the book of, is going to say, the Acts of the Apostles. It's going to say the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. But it really, if you look at it, in actuality, it really should be headed, the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Yes, it's the Acts of the Apostles. But who really was behind the miracles and the acts that they did? The Holy Spirit. So this is just this is my stuff. This is just me. I'm not saying go say the Bible is wrong or change it. I'm just saying this is what I'm saying. When you look at the Acts of the Apostles, it really should be the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Amen. So because he was the one when when he came in the book of Acts, they went and they tarried for the Holy Spirit. Jesus told them to go and wait for the promise. He was crucified. They went and tarried and waited in the upper room. He told them to wait for the promise. They were praying. They were all with one accord. Didn't say they was on one accord. We always say that. The Bible says with one accord. And they waited for the promise. And when they waited, that was uh, the spirit. That was the birth. Church was birthed. On Pentecost, that's when the church was birthed with power. It came, the promise of the Holy Spirit was fulfilled, and, and the Spirit fell on them as cloven tongues of fire, and they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But the tongues that was they were spoke, when you look at it, they were languages. It shows all the languages that were represented under heaven, and this was the prophecy of Joel chapter 2. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And when the, when the Holy Spirit came, every nation of heaven was represented at that time. And the disciples began to speak in other tongues or languages because they spoke in their dialect. And everybody spoke other tongues, other languages, understood them in their native tongue. So that's when the spirit was poured out in Acts and it came then when it came upon them, then Jesus said, after the Spirit comes upon you, then you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the world. So that was when the Holy Spirit came in and with power, and the church was birthed in Acts, when the Holy Spirit came in Acts. So he goes on and tells them, and says, and whatsoever we shall, you shall ask in my name, I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So he's he's leading them up to his departure, and he's letting them know that, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, I'm going to where the Father is, and I'll be there in a, interceding and mediating, sitting on the right hand. And whatever you ask the Father, when you ask it in my name, it says, he said, if anything you ask in my name, I will do it. Then, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So then it comes to our verse of our text for tonight. And it says, he says, if you ask anything, I'll do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Then he says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. So he said, he's going to, so he's going to leave. And then he tells them, well, whatever you ask, ask in my name. In other words, ask, and I'm going to be sitting at the right hand of the Father because He's telling them to ask in his name because I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. And when you see me, you see the Father. But we, when we approach God, we say our Father, like he taught us the prayer in Matthew 6 and in Luke 11, our Father which art in heaven. But when we pray and we make our request, we come our Father. But then we always say in Jesus' name. 
because that solidifies our prayer. So he says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you, not might, he shall give you another comfort. This is Christ, Christ's intercession. He says, you ask me, and then I'm going to pray the Father that he'll going to give you another comforter. So when you pray to me, I'm a, as you pray to me, I'm going to ask the Father. When I leave, you pray. I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to send you another comforter. Or in other words, I'm going to send back my spirit to be in you. It says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. This is Christ's intercession, the, <clears throat> the coming comforter. He says, well, if you ask, ask him my name. And then it says, pray to Father, that he will send you another comforter. Pray to me, I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you another. Again, we said that word another. Comforter means another of the same kind, which means he's saying, I'm going to go, and the Holy Spirit is going to be my spirit that I'm going to send back to dwell in you. Because first, he was with them. And the reason the Holy Spirit has to come, and we need to know who he is, because he is the spirit of Christ that is now resident in us. Because when Jesus was here, he, he, he couldn't be omnipresent. He couldn't be everywhere. Because he was one with the man. He was 100% man, 100% God. But that was one of the attributes that he disrobed himself of when he came was omnipresent. So in one aspect in scripture, uh, when they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, your friend is sick, Lazarus. You need to hurry up because if you don't hurry up, you get to him, he's going to die. The Bible says Jesus purposely stayed and waited till he died. And then it was four days, three or four days. And they came to him. It says too late. He's already dead. And Martha and Mary cried and said, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. So he was not able to be there. So one of the blessings in him and his departure and going back to heaven and dispatching the Holy Spirit is he can be wherever you are. He can be wherever I am. He can be in China. He can be in Texas. He can be in New Zealand. Spirit of God is every. You know, that's amazing, my brothers and sisters, because we look at how powerful God is. We look at how great God is. He's the creator. The Bible says he holds the world in his hands. He created worlds without end and galaxies, all of the stars. He's known by name. He created the sun and the moon. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God. So now if he created everything, the galaxy and the universe and the worlds, then he has to be bigger than outside of. You can't create something to be inside of it. You have to be outside of it to create it. So if he's that great, he's that marvelous and that powerful, and just think, he chooses to live in you and I. If there's a billion people, there is a billion of God's spirit in that people. He can break himself down a billion times to be in each one of them. That's, that's awesome to even think about. So, but Jesus was saying, they said, your friend is dead and you should have been here. So he left and when he came back, he prayed that Lazarus would come back for the glory of God. That's why he was talking about the works that he did. But the point that I'm making is the Holy Spirit. We need to know who he is because we need to know that he's not some force that we have to call. And let me say this. Once you see the Holy Spirit is the agent of, of redemption. That's the way you get saved. When you accept Christ as your personal Savior, ask Him to forgive you of your sins and confess that you're a sinner and ask Him to come into your heart, forgive you of your sins. You tell God that you believe He died for your sins. They crucified Him. They nailed Him to the cross. They put Him in a borrowed tomb. He rose with our power and He's coming back. That's the gospel. When you believe that, the Bible says, when you say it with your, confess it with your mouth, and believe it in your heart, you shall be saved. When you really mean it with your heart and confess it, 
The Bible says that the Holy Spirit, the agent of change, the agent of regeneration, that spirit, the spirit of God comes in and takes up residency in you. Gives you a brand new heart, brand new spirit. Give you a new start. So the Holy Spirit is the agent of regeneration. That's how we get changed from old things have passed away, all things now become new. Is because of the work of the Holy Spirit. That's how you get saved. He is the agent of salvation. So we need to know who he is because he is the one that is, is responsible for me being regenerated and being born again because of the Holy Spirit. And so we need to know who he is. We need to know what his attributes are. We need to understand it's not an it. It's not a thing that he is a person of the Godhead. He has emotions. You can grieve him. You can make him upset when we do wrong. He grieves him. He ha he's intelligent. He teaches us. He prays for us. He leads us. He guides us. He, Jesus said he's going to bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have told. See, everything that Jesus was telling them, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. And then the last thing they remember was seeing him bloody on the cross and bludgeon and beat half to death. Their hopes was dashed. Peter said, I'm going back fishing. I'm going to go back to what I was doing that. So everything that he told them, they didn't really get it then. But then on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, see at first in John, I believe it's John 20, 21, the Bible says, and he breathed on them and we said, receive the Spirit. Okay, they breathed on them, and they received the Spirit. But they had not been filled with the Spirit. See, he didn't tell them to go out and do ministry until they had been filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Ghost. He says, tarry. They had it, but he said, okay, now go tarry, and then when you become filled, now go out and be witnesses. Now it's going to start coming back to you, and the Holy Spirit's job is to bring the Word of God to our remembrance. But we have to study it. We have to get in it. We have to sit and be taught because he can't bring anything to my remembrance that I have not that I have not allowed God to deposit or the Holy Spirit to deposit. How can you get an uh, inch of withdrawal on something you didn't deposit? How can you get something out of out of something you never put in? So if I don't be, sit where the word of God is being taught and get in the presence of God, so the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, can make deposits in me. Then later on, when I need it, whether it's to speak it, whether it's to share it, whether it's to pray, or whether I just need it to be comforted by it. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. So how can he comfort me with something that I don't have? Or I don't allow God to deposit within me. And so uh, it's very important that we know who he is, that we know that he is the agent of regeneration, and we need to know that the reason that we're going to heaven, if we did that and asked God to forgive us and confess with our mouth and believed in our heart, then the Holy Spirit, when he comes in and indwells, that's my ticket to heaven. You have it. It's not that you're going to live right to get there, never that. You, you, we, we live right, because we are saved. We're not living right to be saved. <laughs> because if we were trying to live, if we had to be saved because we live right, nobody would be saved. Because you can live right and you can do right, but can you live righteously enough for God to reward you with eternity? No way you can do it. It doesn't balance out. So because of the love of Christ and because we, the love of God, through Christ, who died for us and shed his blood, and we accept it, now the Holy Spirit comes in, and that's when I accept Christ, now I have my ticket in my heart. And let me say this to you. The Holy Spirit does not come in and out. No way. If he's out, then he's not in. And if he's in, he's not out. That's plain enough for you? He does not jump in and out, my brothers and sisters. Well, I messed up. I did something really bad. Okay. You don't think God already knew that you were going to do what you did? I'm not saying it's okay to do it, but God made provisions for it through the Holy Spirit. It's very important that we know who the Holy Spirit is. 
because he's my covering. And then when he prayed to God and we sin, the Holy Spirit is the agent that begins to move that guilt and that shame. We should feel guilty when we sin, and we should feel shame when we sin because we are disappointed God and we've sinned against him and been disobedient. We're not supposed to stay there. We can get up and brush ourselves off, and the Holy Spirit will let us know that uh, we are still God's child. So he plays a very important role, and we need to know who he is, and we need to understand he's a person of the Godhead. You can grieve him. He has emotion. He has intellect, and he has a will. He has a will. So, But the main point in saying all that I wanted to make, don't ever think that the Holy Spirit leaves you because Jesus paid the price for you. He paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but hallelujah, he washed it white as snow. When the Holy Spirit come in, that's it. You can't you can't change it. Once it's that's if you've been really been saved, you ask God to forgive and you've been saved, the Holy Spirit is in you, he's there. He's going to make sure you get to the presence of God. You can't sin a sin so bad that the Holy Spirit is going to leave you. You probably may feel like it sometime. Uh, we may feel that like we let God down in a really bad way, but the Holy Spirit is there. He does not leave. Because if that's the case, then, then the devil has more power than God. We know that's not true. So salvation is something that God gives us. He gives us his spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. That's a gift. We did not earn it. God gives us his spirit. And because he gave it to you, he's not going to take it back. He gives it to you. And it's an everlasting gift because he loves you that much. He loves you so much that he gives you a gift to last forever. How would that look? A guy give you eternity and then take it back. What kind of God is that? That's our stuff we do. We get mad. I'm going to take it back. You ain't gonna... God, God is not like us. He says, my ways are not like yours. My thoughts are not like yours. High as the heaven is above the earth. My ways and my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. So I'm saying that to say, when you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit. That is the Spirit of Christ. See, Jesus left and he said, I'm going to I'm gonna pray that God send you the promise. It was the promise that had been made that the comforter would come. But he couldn't come while Jesus was here. So now, because Jesus was the comforter then. So then when he left, he sent his spirit back to dwell in all who would call upon the Lord to save them through his name. We call upon the Lord to save us from our sins. He dispatches the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ. Because later on in the text, he says, I'm going to be in you. Amen. So he said, I'll pray the Father, he shall give you another. That in the Greek means another of the same kind. He was the comfort of the end. And that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, the spirit promise, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. So, see, the spirit, most people, they don't, the Holy Spirit, I don't believe in that, Holy Ghost, that stuff. I don't believe in the spirit, because they can't see. Most people... Show it to me. Prove it to me. Show it to me. I'm sure I'm proving it to you now with the word of God. Now show it to me. I'm showing it to you in God's word. I don't believe it. Then you have to walk by faith and not by sight. We have to take God at his word. We take everybody else at their word. Let the government send you a letter tell you your check, income tax check on the way. You're going to start spending money before you get it. But we can take other people and other entities but we want, can we take God at his word? The world cannot see him, so if they can't see it, they're not going to believe it. And not only they can't see it, they don't know him. So if they can't see him and they don't know him, how can they receive it? They can't, and they're not going to. Because they actually have blinders on their eyes where they can't receive it. See? So the Holy Spirit is a gift to those who accept Jesus Christ. When you accept Jesus Christ, then the gift of the Holy Spirit is yours. It says, even the spirit of truth, when the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him. What? Ye know him, 
for he dwelleth with you. See, the world is spiritually blind, but they have spiritual knowledge. They know he say, you know him, for he dwell with you, and he shall, he's going to be in you. Speaking of in the future, spiritual knowledge, spiritual indwelling, dwelling of the spirit, say, you know him. How do you how do they know him? Because of his revelation, what he's been revealing to them about the spirit, what he's been teaching them. The word of God that has been taught to him, he's teaching them about the Holy Spirit. You know him. How we know him? Because I'm telling you about him. And and they didn't get it right then. But he says, But ye know him, for he dwells with you. Watch this. He says, But you know him. But he's dwelling with you. When? Right now. <laughs> but you know him. How we know him, Lord? Because he's dwelling with you right now. That's me. See how, how it goes? How he said, I'm in the Father, the Father in me. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. He's talking about he's in God, God. And then he's talking. Now he's starting to talk as if he is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is in him. He's going to leave and he's going to send his spirit back. The Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ. You know him, but he's with you. How is he with you? I'm here with you right now. You know me, right? Yeah. Okay, well, you know him because he with. I'm with you, and I'm him, and he's me. You know him. He dwells with you and shall be in you. I'm with you now, but when I go to heaven, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray to the Father. He's going to send me back. Ooh, Jesus. I'm going to pray to the Father. He's going to send me back. This time, you're going to get it right. You're going to be able to die for the cause. Because you're going to have enough courage and enough boldness. Because not just, because see, now I got to leave and I can't be with you. But this time, I'm going to be in you. And you're going to have holy boldness. Hallelujah. See? Spirit of truth. Spiritual knowledge. Indwelling. And this what you know. And this information we need to know. And we're going to do, uh, be doing more than likely, be doing a series on the Holy Spirit, more than likely. Uh, but this is something that we need to know. And this information is very pertinent, very important to our uh, growth as a Christian and to be able to receive revelation knowledge from God through the Holy Spirit. Of not just who Jesus is, we need to know about the Holy Spirit because he is the agent that is in the earth now doing the work. He said he's with you. He's going to be in. So now the Holy Spirit is with us and in us. Hallelujah. How are you going to lose? You can't. Can't. Don't have anything to do with what you're experiencing. Don't have anything to do with what it looked like. When you understand that the Holy Spirit is the person he has intellect, he has emotion, he has will, and he's inside of you, then you're going to be careful how you live. You're going to be careful how you act. You're going to be careful what you do because you know the Holy Spirit is in you and you don't want to grieve him. See, so I can't just do what I want because I'm bought with a price. I don't belong to myself. Amen. Hallelujah. Anyhow. So he goes on to say, he shall be in you. He said, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come to you. So then it says, 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and he shall bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said to you. The work of the Holy Spirit, spiritual memory, what is, what is, his, what is he going to do? Who is he? He's the person. What is his work? What does he come to do? He come to comfort you, first and foremost. To give you comfort. That's the spirit. When you need comfort, need God to comfort, that's the Holy Spirit. That's in you. He's not coming from somewhere. God is not sending him from somewhere to come to you. He's already in you. He says he's with you and in you. The comforter, which is the first he says the Holy Spirit. Now he says the Holy Ghost. What? Whom the Father will send in my name. In my name is me. The Father is going to send me back to be in you. And he's going to teach you all things. He's, he's, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. 
whatsoever I have said unto you. See, so he's not going to. I mean, and I and I understand the Holy Spirit. If you lose your keys or if you lose your wallet, uh, you need you can ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, where my wallet at? He he said he'll bring all things to your remembrance. He'll tell you where it is. That's part of his job. He'll do it. Try it and see. Next time you lose your wallet, next time you lose your keys, next time you need to find something, stop and pray. Say, Lord, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking that the Holy Spirit will help me find my keys. If you're a child of God, I believe you're going to find them. Amen? Praise God. So then it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world give, get I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Amen. Our time is almost up. And so we want you to know that the Holy Spirit, if you accepted Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is with you and he's in you right now. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ and you haven't never confessed that you're a sinner and that you need to be saved, then I'm sorry you do not have the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry you don't have it. That's it. That's God's way to be saved. Once you accept Jesus, you confess you're a sinner, confess your sins, and you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Then the Spirit of Christ, which is the Holy Spirit, comes in. You are born again and regenerated. Without that, the Holy Spirit, you go into hell. I'm sorry to tell you, but I have to tell you. There's no other place you can go but heaven or hell. You either do it God's way or the highway. So he loves you so much, he wants you to be saved. So repeat this prayer after me. Father God, right now, in the name of Jesus, I'm repeating this prayer after pastor because I need to be saved. I've never asked Jesus to come into my life and forgive me of my sin. I know I am a sinner. Repeat it. I know I am a sinner. I'm on my way to hell. I know you don't want me to go there because you love me. That's why you made the broadcast available. Father God, right now, I confess I'm a sinner. I confess I need your salvation. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe he came in this world and lived. I believe he died for all my sins. They nailed him to the cross, Father God. I believe it. I believe they put him in the grave. I believe he got up with all power the third day morning. And I believe he's coming back just for me. If you've repeated that prayer, if you said it with your mouth and believed it in your heart, we believe you just got saved. Amen. We believe the Holy Spirit just came in. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Tell somebody that you got saved. Amen. Find your Bible, believe, and teach in church. If you need a church, the Lord House of Prayer for All People, 9318 Southwestern in Los Angeles, 90047. And before we let you go, we pray that you would be a help to this broadcast to help us spread the gospel, to help us share the good news of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. You can download Venmo on your phone. Download the Venmo app and go to gregory white 86 and let the Lord lead you and send us offering to help keep us on there. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Continue to tune in and continue to pray for us. We're going to pray for you. And when we come back, I'm pretty sure we'll be finishing up uh, another lesson on the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless your heart. We love you. Keep the faith. Amen. And I believe this year is going to be a good year for you. God is going to turn it around. I believe the best is yet to come. God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. Can I be honest? Sometimes I don't understand. What do you let me fall? Stop it all if you want.